Well, thank you. And, and again, it's a great honor. I, I you know, I, I truly credit you as one of the, one of sort of the people I look up to and uh, um, just want to get some perspective. We have a bunch of people in here that are excited. Let me, I'm going to change the view here as well. A bunch of people here that are excited for this and I'm sure they'll have some questions we will hopefully relay to you, but I want to get your perspective. You know, you're roughly one generation ahead of me. So you actually probably remember when people were actually healthy. Whereas I was a kid growing up basically in the seventies and it's been, I do remember there was the fat kid, you know, in the neighborhood and we had the, I organized the neighborhood Olympics and everybody came, including the fat kid. And now if you try to do that again, it would be the skinny kid, you know, the, the exception. So it has been uh, tremendous. And, and, uh, um, you know, I think most people are aware, uh, you know, of, of your sort of story, particularly as it's evolved over the last, you know, half year, seven, eight years with all the trials and tribulations you've gone through. But I wanted to ask you, you know, you obviously have a medical degree. What was the decision for you to, to sort of pursue academic research and, and not just practice, you know, clinical medicine? I, I'm just, I, I've never asked you that. I'm just kind of wondering what propelled yeah, that, you to go that route. No, fantastic. That's a great question. So, Sean, I played conventional sports in South Africa, which were cricket and rugby. And then I, I was a year in Los Angeles on an exchange program. And the day we graduated, I asked my best friend what he was going to do for sport. And he said that he was going to row or crew. And I said, you know, that's a really good idea. I think I'm going to do that. So when I came to the University of Cape Town, I decided I went and joined the rowing club. And within a few, about two months, we had a lecture from the Olympic rowing coach from Britain. And he came and was telling us all about the physiology, et cetera, of rowing. And then he went up to the blackboard and he drew on the blackboard on this axis, the y-axis was your blood lactate concentration. And on the, on the x-axis was the distance you'd rowed. And he said, you see what happens when you start rowing is your lactate shoots up. And by a thousand meters, it's so high, you feel terrible. And I thought, you mean you can measure these things? And I literally walked out of that lecture and I said, biology, physiology, that's what I'm going to study. Now, I was so very fortunate because it was 1969 and 68 had been the Olympics at altitude. And there was a great interest now all of a sudden in sports science. And, then, and that was the very year the needle biopsy was introduced into physiology and people were measuring glycogen. So there I was reading all about glycogen and how more glycogen in the muscles make you go faster. And so I thought, I'm the king. I really understand this. So I then decided when I was studying medicine that I, I was more interested in physiology and in preventive health. And I wasn't really interested in, in curative medicine. And so after a year's internship, when I graduated from my internship, I went straight into research. And by then I knew that that was my life direction. I was much more interested in understanding understanding how things happen and why they happen. Yeah. I mean, even though I ended up doing orthopedics and I, you know, you, you were referring to 96, I think it was the Mexico city Olympics, which was at altitude. And they had some people throwing things and jumping very far because that altitude helped them out, didn't it? But uh, I, I mean, honestly, my favorite subject in all of medical school was, was a human, was a physiology part. I just, I just yeah. love that stuff. And it was really interesting to look at the patterns and start to figure things out. I and mean, he had to remember some of the exceptions, but that was my favorite uh, sort of thing that I saw. Now, I want to get your perspective on this because you've been around and you've been in science for a long time. And I, I don't know if this has always been the case. I mean, I'm sure there's been some sort of academic politiz politization of, 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 of science. And I, it seems like it's devolving. And, and now it's not just academic politics, but it's politics, politics is going on. Yeah, Are you yeah. sort of seeing this as well? And do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I can see that there's been a breakdown in our internet connection, but I'll just keep talking. So unquestionably, when I went into science in the 1976, the control the pharmaceutical industry exerted over the physicians and doctors and the lecturers was much less than it is today. I literally, there were two laboratories that you could choose to study at in my university. And my university was considered a leading university in Africa, but there were only two labs which were doing decent research. And both of them were, were minimis, minimally funded by industry. In fact, pretty little from industry. And that's changed all today. It's at my university. The, the research laboratories are absolutely dependent on the pharmaceutical industry. And in fact, the, the teaching of medicine at my university is, is fundamentally dependent on the pharmaceutical industry. 
Yeah, that, that, that's becoming you know clear. It's tough to get research done, and it, and it costs so much. I mean, there's not a lot of people that have that that deep a pop, uh, pockets to do the type of research that we would consider high quality research. So it's very very challenging. Um, Tim, what have you been what have you been doing lately in the last few years? I know you you since you've won your trial and you've you sort of somewhat been vindicated from this silliness that happened on Twitter that was so disgusting to me, quite honestly. But what have you been up to? I know you've got the Noakes Foundation, but what's been what's been occupying your time the last you know year or two? So we wrote the book, The Real Food on Trial, which I'm sure you know you don't mind me showing it. But there it is, and uh, that's. That took. That was the whole story of the trial, and it. They're probably by 2019 we'd finished that. I then started working with CrossFit and wrote for their website, and I wrote 25 columns on the evolution of the low-fat diet, and basically the 70 events that explain why the distortion was produced by by industry and by the scientists. And I'm just kind of working that into a book at the moment. That took a lot of effort. It, it really, I went into great detail on these 70 events. So that's been my, my really the work I've been doing in the last year. I am retired, so, so it's not that, <laughs> that I should be working hard. But then with the Noakes Foundation, we run the Nutrition Network, which is educating doctors about the role of the low carbohydrate diet. And it's training doctors and dietitians and nurse, nurses and other practitioners how to prescribe a low carbohydrate diet. And that's been incredibly successful. So we're very happy about that. And then up to the start of COVID, we had we have the Eat Better South Africa campaign. We're, we're actually working with poorer communities in Cape Town and showing that they can eat, the, they can afford the low carb diet, which is the myth is that it's a very expensive diet. It's not. That's if you want to eat really good good, you know, well-prepared foods and so on. But if you go to the basics of the low-carbohydrate diet, you can actually eat well on, on relatively little. And we show that these people reverse their diabetes and they reverse their hypertension very, very quickly because they have the worst diet. It's the diet that is the fullest of sugar and processed foods. And the, the results are astonishing. So that's, yeah. that's our focus at the moment. And I think one of the things, one of the points that I think many people fail to see, and it's a, to me, it's a fairly obvious point, but a low-carb diet in general, not always, but tends to be devoid of these highly processed foods. I mean, it's hard, you know, particularly like the diet I'm on, which is a meat-based diet, it's hard to get junk food. I mean, it's impossible pretty much. I mean, there's no such thing. So it's really just a shift away from the the, the modern sort of hyper-processed. You know, I, I, I interviewed a fellow named Gabor Adrosi the other day. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but I think you know, it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, looking at how we've sort of so powdered the food, you know, we've been taking food that normally we would have to chew and process and masticate to, to smaller size, but not these powders and then how they interact with the incretin hormones as they travel down the gastrointestinal tract in a, in a, in a normal, you know, sequential sequence that takes time. And now we've got this hyperabsorptive state. Do you think uh, just you, I know you talked about just eat real food and, and stuff like that, but what do you, how much of this is, you know, just getting away from the junk? I, I absolutely agree with you. I think when we started, uh, when I first went low carbs, I assumed that it was because I was diabetic. I presumed that the only benefit was because I was not eating carbs. I, I quite agree with you. It's more complex than that. And I think that the pre refined processed foods are driving the food addiction and that's causing the problem. So to me, obesity is a carbohydrate, sugar, refined foods uh, addiction. And you can't reverse it unless you reverse the issue, the, the, particularly the sugar addiction. That's what I've learned in the last few years, which I wouldn't have thought about uh, eight, ten years ago when I started on the start. So cutting the carbohydrates is really important, but it's critical that you get rid of the sugar and the processed foods. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, a person by the name of Karen Thompson, who I guess she was uh, Christian Bernard's, uh, I guess, granddaughter, I believe. She, 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 she's South African. I think you, know, I think you know, of, know of her, I believe. And she runs this quit sugar thing. And I've talked with her and eaten dinner with her. And I know she's switched over to a meat-based diet. And it's helped her tremendously to come off the sugar addiction. Do you, uh, I know you've sort of kind of dabbled with a, with a meat-centric diet. Is that, is that what you're, where are you at currently these days? Yeah, no, much more. I eat very little of vegetables now. And I don't know why that happened, but I think it was your influence. <laughs> In fact, I'm certain it was your influence. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because, 
you know, I was raised on the idea that you had to have some vegetables to be healthy. And then, you know, I followed what you did. And it seemed to me that maybe that was incorrect. I must say, you know, the interesting point about my life and my story is that I come from a family that my mother was in meat and my father was in tobacco. <laughs> so, and this was when they lived in Liverpool. And uh, my mother raised me. She knew meat was good and she knew fish was good. And so I was raised on lots of meat and lots of, we had lots of, uh, of liver and offal when I was growing up and bone marrow and everything, which was just like what you're eating. I was eating that as a child. And then, of course, I went to medical school and I became clever. And then I changed to the cereals and grains. When that came out in 1977, I was working in cardiology. So with these experts and how could I suggest that they were wrong? So, you know, you went with them and we dropped the meat and we dropped everything and we started eating the margarine. And within 10 years, I, there was huge changes in my body, but I didn't really appreciate it at the time. Yeah, it's interesting how... And I'm not sure why this is, but it seems like our, you know, the human body is a collection of a lot of things. You know, we've got, we've got different organs, different organ systems. You know, as an orthopedic surgeon, you're kind of seen as a meathead who's in there doing carpentry. But we've kind of been very cardiac centric. And so it seems like the cardiologists have driven the entire narrative of medicine. And it's been very sort of anti-cholesterol based. Uh, you know, I think as you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the research coming out. I just saw an article that came out today looking at lipoprotein insulin resistance scores being, you know, 600% increased in women, whereas increased LDL only caused a 40% increase in, in insulin yeah. of cardiovascular. So you're seeing that there's so much more nuance for that, but we're still, I mean, we're still in this model that's, gosh, I mean, it's got to be 50 years old. Why, why can't we break free of that? We can't break free of it because industry controls the cardiologists as they control the endocrinologists. And I mean, that's what I discovered. I think that, you know, the, the, the funniest moment in my career was one of the people who attacked me was head of endocrinology at my university. And Eric Westman came to Cape Town and he was invited to speak to the endocrinology group at the University of Cape Town and the Kruderskir Hospital. And I was invited. And when I walked in, there was just everyone stiffened and tightened and I could see that I wasn't welcome. Anyway, Eric gave a long story. He spoke for 15, 20, 30 minutes about all the studies he'd done showing the benefits of low carbohydrate diet. And then he finished, you know, and he said, a really good way to start is just take an anecdote, just take a patient and put them on the start and see what happens and measure HDL and triglycerides and glucose and insulin. And the endocrinologist said, you see, that's the trouble with you people. You only speak about anecdotes. So he said to her, but, but I've just spent half an hour telling you all the studies we've done showing the benefits. Didn't you hear it? And they're, they're literally, literally, they don't hear it. It just goes straight over their head. Because I, I had this famous 12, 2012 debate at my university against Jacques Rousseau, who was from the NIH and was involved in the Women's Health Initiative, and who distorted the results, who willfully distorted the results in that study. And I proved that and showed it in, the, in many ways and, and I published the evidence. And... These, these people, you just can't change. When I spoke at that debate, it, I could just see I was talking to a sea of faces which couldn't interpret this information. And now, despite winning my trial, <laughs> my medical school still teaches exactly as they always did. And I speak to the people. I said, you know, there are so many opportunities for research. You know, why don't you take a few people with rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases and put them on a carnivorous diet. It costs you nothing. Why don't you just see what happens? No, can't do that. It, it's the, the ignorant or the inability to be creative and think creatively is utterly astonishing. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, I have hope that we'll be able to do that sooner. You know, like I said, I'm yeah. in the process of raising funds for that. And it's, you know, they, these are, these, these things can be expensive, you know, depending on how many people you want to do. And, you know, so it's yeah. considered a good, good trial. Um, one of the things, so let me ask you, because you're in South Africa. I just had a guest on yesterday by the name of Eric Edmies, and apparently his relatives were some of the original South African researchers that did a lot of anthropologic research at Witzwaters Rand and, you know, some yes. of these you know, famous universities where they do that. Can we oh, sorry, can look? Sorry, you cut out. I don't know if you can hear me, but you, oh, you cut out. So just can you rephrase the question? Yeah, sorry. I was just, can you hear me now, Tim? Did we lose him? Uh-oh. I don't know if it's his or mine. Let me. Uh, let sorry, me I didn't hear that. Could you start again? 
Yes, of course. Can you can you hear me now, Tim? Yes, yes, everything's fine. Okay, I, I was just bringing up the point that yesterday we had a guest on by the name of Eric Ed Meads, and his his grandfather, I think, was a famous researcher at University of Witzfeldersrand, and you know, down in South Africa. And we talked quite a bit about anthropology. Do you feel that there is any, you know, because some people think this is irrelevant. Do you think there's a relevance to human evolution and diet? Do you think we should pay attention? What do you think that shows? If so. So, you know, now this is another amazing story. My parents emigrated from Britain to Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, as it was in, in 1946. And they eventually built a house next to a guy called Trevor Jones. And Trevor Jones was the person who in 1937 told the professor at Witwatersrand, Raymond Dart, that there was a farm at Sterkfontein in Johannesburg and they were finding these primate skulls, uh, baboon skulls, and they knew where you find those primate skulls, you find the early humans. And he was, they then went there within a few weeks, they discovered uh, Australopithecus africanus, Mrs. Pleas was discovered there. So it was really interesting because I was introduced to him from a young age and he was the person who my dad got to talk to me and then I decided to do medicine. So I've had a very great interest. And in fact, I've got many of the, the original books written by Dart and other people. So yes, I think it has a huge relevance to us. We mate made us human as, as you know, and you can't get away from that fact. We wouldn't have these brains if it wasn't for meat and, and marrow and, and other fats sources in the, in the body. Yeah, I think that's, 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 uh, you know, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, when we look back at, uh, you know, because I, I brought up with this guest yesterday, I said, you know, I think, you know, we started hunting, you know, early on, you know, perhaps Homo erectus sort of, sort of perfected that skill, so to speak, with, with hunting these big animals. He would say, you know, even if you go back farther, probably the Australopithecines were hunters, you know, chimpanzees are vicious hunters, they're, they're organized yeah. packs. And so we see that as a, early primate feature and we've just gotten better and better at it. And I think that sort of informs us on how we eat. I mean, you know, I, I, I look at, you know, when I look at how I design it, how do I design it, how you design a diet for different species, you know, and you may, you point this out, you know, you don't bring a graft, a giraffe to the grocery store and ask him what you should eat. You look where he's eating in his native environment. He's eating the, you know, the acacia leaves or, you know, whatever he's doing. And, uh, so humans are the same way. We just don't have wild humans to observe anymore, not any real ones. Even, I think even the indigenous tribes are not truly representative of our ancestors, you know, 50, 100, 200,000 years ago. And that's why Western Price's work is so critical. And without, you know, that book nearly went lost, as you know, and it was just discovered and reprinted. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what he had discovered. And it's astonishing how he, he that the work was never really publicized in his lifetime and it took him to die and then other people to discover his work and show how critical it is that you should eat the the diets that your great 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 ancestors ate i often draw attention to the mid-victorians and the studies there that in the 1850s to 1870s the english were the healthiest because they had all the food that the real foods were cheap and everyone was eating them and then all of a sudden they started importing processed foods because the canning industry had just started. And so they, they imported all these foods that can survive without being frozen and so on. And their health went down. And so the, by the time of the Boer War, which was to 1900, the, the, about 50% of the recruits couldn't be accepted because they were malnourished now and they were too small and and weak because they were now eating carbohydrates instead of the lovely vegetables. Now I shouldn't say vegetables first, but the lovely meat and vegetables and animal produce that had made them so healthy. Yeah, I think we see a similar thing with with the Japanese army back in the. I think the the emperor was just just, just disappointed because the recruits couldn't meet the minimum height requirement of four foot eleven. And they started, you know, because they were largely vegetarian back, you know, 200 years ago. And so they started pushing for meat in the diet so they could raise their average, average population height. Let me ask you, Tim, in South Africa, because, you know, Banting had taken off in no, no small part due to your influence over there. And, you know, you hear all these people talking about Banting. What is the over, is, is it, is low carb more accepted there than other parts of the world, in your opinion? Or is it still sort of struggling to, to catch foothold? 
Sorry, I, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'll start anyway. No. I can't hear you, but I'll continue. So what happened when we published The Real Meal Revolution, the book went mad in this country and it sold, it became one of the best sellers in the history of South African literature. So I don't know if you heard that, about, I was talking about The Real Meal Revolution. So the book went ballistic and very quickly, it, everyone was talking about it. And there was only one topic that people talked about was the banting diet when they were eating. And that lasted for a year or two. And we can measure the impact in some way because there's a Facebook page called the Seven Day, Seven Day Banting Meal Plan Facebook page. And it has 2.3, 2.4 million followers. And it's, it's centered in Cape Town. It's not just South Africans. But that can give you an idea of how, the, how remarkable this was. So I think that being a small country, a relatively small country, okay, we have 50 million people, but you know, it's interesting, we, the message gets out quickly to the population. We don't have the divisions that are in other countries, which are bigger, but it seems to me that, commun that, that information spreads less rapidly. And I, this, I think, it just went like viral throughout South Africa. So, yes, there was a huge impact. And I think that we, we saw that because wheat products went down. And the, the again, the sugar has gone down. Again, the wheat industry is complaining that they're not selling enough wheat. And the sugar industry is in huge problems in South Africa. So, of course, there are other factors. But there's no question the Banting diet has been one of those factors. There, well, I guess South Africa is, is an interesting, you know, I've, I've had the fortune to be down there many times. I know, you know, my mother was from Benoni yeah. and I, I visited, not, I haven't been there in gosh, almost 30 years now. So I need to get back down there, but you've got just a very different mix of different culturals and cultures. And, you know, do you feel that this diet is a low carb diet or a banting diet or a carnivorous diet only works for certain populations or is this, is this, is this something humans can do as general? What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, absolutely. Of those, a, of the 2 million people on the Banting's Facebook page, 80% are either Zulu or Kosa speaking South Africans. So they're indigenous Africans and they've benefited hugely from it. And that's, we're working with communities which are, are not white, they're largely African, Amer African, sorry, or, or what we call so-called colored, which is a, not a nice word. Mixed race is a better word. But we work with those communities and they do just as well. And again, as I said, because their diet is so awful. You know, if you go back to, you will know this, but when the Nguni tribes came into Southern Africa, they brought with them cattle. And the culture was built around the Nguni cattle. And there were a couple of things that happened. So just as the bison were shot out in the United States, these, these cattle were shot out in this country as part of the war between the British and the Zulus. And so that then the community that had been raised on meat suddenly uh, were no longer eating meat. And then we had the Rinderpest virus, which destroyed the cattle. And that caused the Zulu and Kosa speaking South Africans to have to go and live in the cities. And then they started eating the white man's diet. And within 20 years, the diabetes and obesity rates started to rise. So that's the story. And so I, my belief is that the, the Zulu and Kosa speaking South Africans are probably based on carnivorous diets in the past. And that now they've been put on this high carbohydrate diet. And that explains why the obesity and diabetes epidemics have hit them as badly as they've hit the plains Americans, the, the Plains Indians in America. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I was going to ask you, why is it that certain populations seem to tolerate carbohydrates before, you know, sort of the devastation, you know, occurs? And we see that, you know, and when we compare, say, Asians where they don't have very much room to get fat before they develop diabetes, but we see these indigenous tribes, the, the Pacific Islanders, the Native Americans, the First Nations people in, in Canada, you know, the, some of the African populations. We, and so your belief is because they lived a longer time on a perhaps a hunting type of diet that now their genetics and, you know, overall collective experiences left them very vulnerable to carbohydrates. Is that, is yeah, that I have no say? question. You know, I mean, I've once met there's some Persians some Iranians, and they said, don't talk to me about low carb diets. He said, Iran, we were the first people to eat the carbs and we do fine on them and we can't do without the grains. And I suspect that that's true. 
that the Iranians and the people in the Persian Gulf are the ones who were first exposed to grains. But I'm my background is obviously like yours, it's probably English. And and we were exposed to grains only a couple of thousand years ago. We've had a much less exposure. And if you come from the north, you would have been there were you couldn't grow grains, you couldn't grow fruit and veg, so you had to eat what was available, and that was going to be mainly meat. So there's no question that the, the instance of insulin resistance is very different. It's very high in Australian Aborigines and also the Pacific Islanders who also have lived off fish and coconuts all their lives. They've, there's never been wheat and sugar grown there at all. Yeah, I saw, you may be familiar with some of the work of a guy named Michael Richards, who's out of Max Planck, and he's done some of the isotopic data analysis. And, you know, most of what I've sort of known him for was looking at, you know, early, early humans and Neanderthals in Europe and seeing that they were fairly carnivorous. But there was an interesting, he did a study looking at Pacific Islanders and looking at their isotopic data. And what he found out was that they were primarily subsisting on pigs, but interestingly, they were feeding the pigs fish. So they were, they were fishing to feed the pigs to feed themselves, which I thought was a very unique, uh, interesting sort of situation. So, Indeed, that's very interesting, yeah. Let me ask you about, so we've got a couple members in this group that are, that are South African. We, you know, we, we have you know, a pretty broad international community now that continues to grow. And uh, I understand that you know, during this, this pandemic time, there's been quite a bit of lockdowns in South Africa. Is there any sort of messaging out there talking about metabolic health and improving host susceptibility to viruses or has it all been just the reactive you know stay at home eat pizza watch tv don't go outside and and, and put a mask on i mean is there any any thought anyone in the government saying hey why don't you lose weight improve your metabolic parameters is anybody saying that at all not one it's <laughs> unbelievable and uh, partly because of that, we've written a new book with Marika Sporos, who was the co-author on The Real Food on Trial. And it's called The Eat Right Revolution, and it does focus on metabolic health and COVID. And there is a study out of my university and other universities in the Western Cape. And I've, you, I've got the figure in the, in the text, and it shows that there are only two risk factors for fatal outcomes, two significant risk factors for fatal outcomes in, in COVID-19, age, and type 2 diabetes, and that's it. And this study was done by people who were looking to see whether, the diabetes, whether tuberculosis and HIV increased the risk. It hardly at all. The one was diabetes, and guess what? It hardly, it hardly raised a mention in the article because for some reason you can't discuss diabetes because that's prejudicial to the patient or something. I, I don't understand it. And I think that's the issue that, you know, we don't... We don't judge people and you know if you have diabetes well that's just too bad luck and we're not going to help you and try and tell you how to get around it i just i just don't understand it at all yeah i mean it's hard not to be conspiratorial a little bit or at least you know at least question the motives and i think they're you know like you mentioned there's there's quite a bit of financial incentives to sort of have a status quo type of thing because it seems to me if anything would have exposed the you know, and you, you've been saying this for many years and I've been saying for many years, you know, we need, we've got a serious problem with chronic disease and we're not, we're not very effective at treating it. And it seems like looking, you know, if we look at the countries that have been greatly affected by this, this sort of infectious disease pandemic, it's countries where the metabolic health is bad. You know, if you look at, like yeah. I, I point out the fact that Vietnam has the lowest rate of infection and death in the world, and they also have the lowest rate of obesity. I think they've got like a 3% obesity rate. And somebody in, in, you know, people are not saying, well, wait a minute, maybe we can do something that I guess the excuse is it's too hard. It's too yeah. hard to make people lose weight or change their behavior. And so we might as well not even attempt to do that. Um, you know, no, I, 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 but I think it's, I think the bottom line is that if you admit that metabolic health is an issue, then you have to admit that diet's an issue. And then you have to admit that actually diet's the main driver of ill health. And that is so contrary to the medical model that it can't be said. So, I mean, I know that you, you would probably agree with me that 85% of chronic disease is related to nutrition and you can't treat it with drugs. But we teach our, do our young doctors that they must try treat everything with drugs. And that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I just have to read this comment to you, Tim. There's somebody saying they, they typed in Eat Right Revolution into YouTube and the results came up as a plant-based doctor 
trying to sell plant-based things. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I know you laugh, but I mean, you know, it's, it's concerning that we see the sort of, you know, algorithms that are pushing us and pushing us to this plant-based. And I, I use, I just conflate or not conflate. I just equate plant-based diets to cheap and cheap and profitable. That's all I see. Yeah. I see, you know, you've got yeah. a cheap product and you can make a huge profit on it. And unfortunately we're seeing that. Um, is, are we, are you seeing similar in South Africa, a huge push in advertising to, to eat this sort of fake food and plant-based stuff? Is that taken off there or? Actually, you know, it's, that's interesting. Not really. It's just to continue eating the processed foods. People aren't okay. actively saying that you should go vegetarian or vegan. But the, the good news is I was telling to a lady from London yesterday who's writing a, a definitive book to expose the vegan myth. And it, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I think this is the one that I don't think you've ever picked up. But there's an Australian study where they took 1,200 vegans and they asked them, actually, what are you eating? At the end of the day, they discovered that one of the 1,200 was actually vegan. <laughs> the other group were all eating meat and, and other animal produce. Well, I mean, I guess they're identifying as vegans. You know, I guess you're allowed yeah. to do that these days. But uh, what, uh, you know, do you find, so do you find that it is, are you, how, how, do you, how do you manage to stay optimistic? Are you do, you, do you find that there's hope here, Tim, or what's your thoughts on that? You know, I, it, that's a really interesting question because I, I've never been as unhappy as I have in the last few months, you know, with this American election. I think that really upset me. And fortunately, it's over now and we can move on. But I just see that the distortion of the truth by the mainstream media is just so unbelievable. And it's completely, the country, this country, the mainstream media controls everything. So what is being said on Sky and CNN and BBC is that's all we get. And our newspapers are exactly the same. And I, I can't trust much of, it or, of any of it. And so that's, that's depressing to know that the media has been completely swamped by, by commercial interests and that's what they're driving. So from that point of view, yes, it's awful. But the, the good side is the only way we're going to survive is in communities. And the, we're just going to have to build communities which have been destroyed and build them to, to be self-sustaining and understand what you need to do to remain healthy. So I think eventually the truth must come forward and eventually people will realize we can't continue to listen to the so-called experts because they're all corrupted. And, and I see it again with the vaccine and the fact that the drug ivermectin is, being, is not being properly assessed. It's being demonized even before it's been given a chance. And there's a real possibility that it could be effective. But that's against somebody's interest, so that therefore it has to be suppressed. So no, I'm positive because... The thing is that the diet works and you can't hide it. And once you've seen that the diet works, you know it works, you can't ever not believe it. And in the medical students that, that I do now get the fortunate, am fortunate enough to teach, they get it. We ask them after the lectures, series of lectures, what have you learned about nutrition? And they all say, well, I now realize it's the most important component for my personal health. And once we can get the doctors to start realizing that, we're, we're moving forward. You know, it's it, because it's interesting because, you know, you, you're, you're a scientist. You're, you're, I mean, I'm sure you're very cautious about the way you interpret things and you've, you've had a, years of experience doing science. And when you look at some of the scientists out there and you, and you sort of say, well, wait a minute, there's some conflicting interests there, you immediately get sort of lumped in with people that think the earth is flat and, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a secret alien plot to take over the world. How do you, I mean, how do we allow continued scientific discourse to, to, and that's what science should be. It should be questioning rather than just this, everybody has to sing from the same song sheet, no matter what, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and not be considered some sort of outcast. How do we, how do we push back on that? Yeah. And that's the difficult because that's what happened to me because as soon as I went against what the university taught, they, they pushed me out and tried to publicly humiliate me as they did for Gary Fetke and as they did to you. And that's, that's the goal. And that's so sad. And, and I, that, I think, is what frightens me about the mainstream media. You cannot have a contrary opinion. And there is no debate anymore. So I appreciate that this is what we have to fight against. 
and how will we get around it? I, I don't know. I must say that my son became really interested in the way the social media was used to attack me. My university didn't just attack me in the press, they attacked me in the social media as well. And he's currently writing a series of articles on, on bullying. And it, well, at least we're exposing it. So he's the first person ever to describe the condition of online academic bullying, OAB. And he describes what happened to me and how it fits a particular pattern. And if you have these seven events, then you know you're being bullied. So the point is that this gets exposed and eventually people have to realize it. And I think bullying is, is a component of this. And people are now realizing that it's widespread in academia and it has to be rooted out as best we can. Yeah, I mean, social media is extremely powerful. And the problem is, you know, the people that own the social media and own the platforms also have a, a sort of uh, narrative that they, they want to continue to, 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 produce, to, to propagate. Let me ask you, so in South Africa and perhaps other parts of the world, and, you know, certainly you probably have more familiar with South Africa, how practical, sustainable, uh, scalable is a low-carb diet in, in that part of the world? You know, some people say it's too expensive. We can't do it. We've got to continue on the grain-based model because we have too many people. What are your thoughts on, on that? Well, we're trying to disprove that. And, and we, can, we can prove that you can feed people in South Africa for three dollars a day on a low carb diet, so it may not be the the tastiest diet, it may not be the most varied diet, but it's healthy, and you're not you're getting the nutrients you need without the excess calories and excess carbohydrates. So it can be done. The you don't have to eat rump steak and sirloin every day. <laughs> you can get by on tinned fish and eggs and milk and cheese and other other foodstuffs. But it can be done, but the, there's little uptake, unfortunately, even in this country, there's little uptake to, to try to make it a reality. There is a, yeah, because you have a large number of the pop, percentage of the population that lives in poverty. You know, you still have Absolutely. quite a bit of poverty in South Africa yeah. and, and, and you, you've been able to reach those communities and show efficacy in, in those groups as well, correct? Correct, and the, and the beauty is these people have been isolated and as you know, South African history, the apartheid regime t took dignity from these people. And what they will tell us is that for the first time, we feel like we're in control of our lives again. And we, once we start eating properly, we don't have to go for our medications. We don't stand in line at hospitals. We start to feel healthier. We get an extra day, working day a month because we don't have to go to hospital to get our medications. So the benefits are huge and they recognize them. They talk about the party packs. You go to the hospital and you get a party pack of medicines and they take them and they said, doesn't change anything. I've been you taking this for 20 years and I'm still taking them. Whereas your diet allows me to stop taking this medication and actually starts to reverse the diseases. I mean, it's fairly clear. I mean, and the U.S. is probably the most egregious example of this, but we spend, you know, $3.5 trillion a year on healthcare, chronic disease mostly, and growing every year. Um, that's a huge amount of the GDP, and, if it, and that's, that's direct spending, and there's indir indirect costs are beyond that. But I'm sure South Africa also is spending a lot of money on diseases, which could be largely minimized through lifestyle stuff. Why, why can't somebody see the financial incentive from a government standpoint and say, look, we wouldn't have to spend X amount of our dollars on taking care of overweight people or diabetic people. Why can't we change that? <laughs> uh, my, my answer is that the politicians have been bought by, the, by industry. That's a simple explanation because the uptake of the diet, as we've shown, has been very big in South Africa. You would have thought the politicians would have jumped on it, but they completely ignore it. And it's not as if they aren't aware of it. I really got into trouble because I was invited to speak to Parliament on this topic. And the next day, my university jumped on me because they said you're stoking a revolution with a dangerous diet and you're promoting its use throughout South Africa and it's going to kill all the South Africans. And so that was, it's not as if the politicians are not aware of what's going on, but they choose not to act and it's to their shame ultimately. And you, they're going to kill all the South Africans as opposed to the current diet, which is going to do what, I wonder, you know, that would be my, my, my sort of retort to that. But I, I just sort of, you know, wonder about 
You know, and what is this based on? You know, why do we think that, that a low carb diet is going to kill you? Where's the evidence that shows that? I mean, how do you, how do you justify that, that statement or how, how do you think someone justifies that? What, what evidence are they using to show that? Well, what I learned in my trial was that they, they don't care about it. The dietitians in South Africa absolutely don't care about the facts. There's, I don't know what they taught, but all I know is that when we went to court, I, we presented 6,000 pages of evidence for the low carbohydrate diet and the prosecution produced one scientific paper which we claim is fraudulent because it was, it, there was data there that didn't come in the original data, so it appeared somewhere. And that influenced the outcomes of the meta-analysis. And anyway, the diet that was studied was a high carbohydrate diet for less than 45%. It wasn't what we're talking about. But that got promoted throughout South Africa as proof that the Banting diet doesn't work. A diet, because the diet with 45% carbohydrate couldn't change various parameters. And so therefore the, the low carbohydrate diet doesn't work. But we made the point that actually you're not studying the Banting diet, but they don't care. It's astonishing. So I, I had to go to court to realize that evidence is not what these people concern themselves with. And whenever I speak to senior dietitians and I start talking, then they just fall back on, no, but you must eat a balanced diet in moderation. And, and what's that? That's not science. You can't measure moderation and you can't see what's in balance. And, but that's the level of the intellect. And unfortunately, they're not taught physiology properly. They're not taught biochemistry. And the only good outcome of my trial was that they closed the nutrition and dietetics department at my university. So that's one thing we did manage to achieve. <laughs> I didn't hear about that, but that's interesting. You know, I think, you know, and, and I'll, I'm sure you're familiar with Nina Teicholz. I mean, I know you are. And she's, she, you know, she had this you know, really nice book and she's been, she's been laboring for the last, you know, half decade trying to see reform, particularly with regard to the U.S. dietary guidelines. And I just watched Nina, you know, just, you know, she gets all the experts. You know, she had members on the past dietary guidelines committee saying, this is nonsense. We shouldn't do this. And again, same old story. So I just, yeah. I just, I don't have a lot of faith in the government or these government entities to change their recommendation or guidelines. I think it's, you know, and you talk about the wisdom of the crowds and I think it's just, you know, we've got to do a grassroots. I mean, do you, do you, do you think there's any, I mean, if, if you're going to like, what's the, what's the game plan? What's the strategy to fix people? Cause I mean, you, I mean, we, I think we both want to truly help people to get healthy. I mean, it's just, I know your father passed away and I, you know, I just hate seeing people unnecessarily suffer. And so if we can't count on the government, how do we get there? What are your thoughts? Yeah, can I just butt in there with, well, Nina was one of my expert witnesses in my trial and it was, she was on the, on the stand for a day and she gave all her evidence and the senior prosecution lawyer who's played a fortune to try and find me guilty. At the end, he just didn't ask her one question. <laughs> he just asked her, so Ms. Teichold, when are you leaving South Africa? So she said, tomorrow morning. So he says, well, I hope you have a good trip and I hope you enjoyed your stay here. <laughs> she just flattened him and he couldn't say a word. So how are we going to change it? I, you know, I, you, it's not going to come through government as Nina's proved once and again, more than once. But if you look at the evidence, it seems to me that people are becoming more evidence-based and they're becoming more aware of the evidence. And I noticed that on Twitter, the evidence is just accumulating. And more and more organizations finally are realizing they can't ignore it forever. The American Diabetes Association appears to be moving. Even the American Heart Association it seems to be moving away from the purely, you, you must avoid saturated fat. So I do, if you go back 10 years, we are in a totally different space than we were 10 years ago. And knowledge acceptance goes exponentially. So I think, you know, it, we're, on the, we're on the bottom of the curve, but at least it's turning. And that means that there's going to be an exponential increase in the, in the future. So although I remain a bit pessimistic, I think ultimately things will have to change. You know, and maybe some countries are going to be ahead of the other countries. It seems to me Canada might be a little bit ahead of the United States. There may be other countries. Well, Australia is not moving at the moment, but there, are, there may be other scientifically adept countries which will move ahead of, of the US and the United Kingdom and Europe and bring about change. 
I wonder if just if South Africa could get better at exporting biltong to the rest of the world, if we could we could change the world with that. I don't know. Is that something you still enjoy, Tim? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, I have that every day. So I can't go without my meat and, and the dried meat, the biltong that you're speaking about. Yes, I would eat that every day. Yeah, I'm just. This is something, and I know this is probably some people will be upset with this question, but. Um, you know, my sort of belief is that early humans hunted these large animals, these mega herbivores, these hippopotami, the rhinos, the, the elephants and stuff like that. Um, and I know that, that they're, they're considered a, you know, endangered species right now. I know the black rhino was on the verge of extinction on there. I'm not sure if they've recovered or not. But is there any, I mean, is it something that some people still eat in maybe not in South Africa or other parts? And, and if so, what is it? What, I wonder what it was like, was it, you know? I don't no, know. I think you, the, what they think. Go ahead. I think the animals you're talking about will only be found in the game reserves where they're highly protected. The rhinoceros, as you know, is hunted to extinction, but for its for its horns, not for its meat. The meat is left there, and the same with elephants in the ivory. They they didn't worry about the meat. So by and large, there is some poaching of animals, but it's only in the game reserves. So it's not. Yeah, there's no opportunity to to for a wide bred slaughter of these animals because they are protected and well looked after and there are relatively few of them. People again don't, don't understand that once upon a time Africa was full of animals. You know in the, in the desert near us there, there, were, there were springbok, these, the springbok antelope would come through in their millions and the farmers would say they would come through for days. They would see these, the great treks of these, the springbok. Can you imagine how many animals there were? Now, if you were a human, how easy would it be to catch the baby or to, to kill those animals? There were so many of them. We had to be carnivores under those, those. There was no reason. There was no need to grow other things when there was so much game available. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about, though, how do you turn the tide? I think for better or worse, it's going to have to be probably, well, obviously the grassroots people demanding it, but I think there's going to have to be some degree of profitability for someone. Someone's going to have to figure out how to make money from this, uh, whether it's corporations saying, hey, I don't have to pay health insurance for much for all my employees being sick. And so therefore we're going to push this. You know, I can see a large auto, you know, maybe Ford Motor Company or UPS or something that says, hey, look, we can save X millions of dollars a year if we pr pr promote a diet. And, you know, yes, you may take money away from pharmaceutical companies and some of the food manufacturers, but other food manufacturers will pop up and sort of fill in that void. I'm, I'm just thinking if that's the, you know, I, I just don't think there's, you can, you can escape the fact that people are going to do what's going to make them the most money. Yeah, you know, the irony is that I used to be the professor for a particular life insurance company, medical life insurance company in South Africa. And as soon as I went this way, and in fact, sorry, I was their spokesperson for the high carbohydrate grain-based diet. They used me as the image of this is the diet you should be eating. And as soon as I reversed that and went against that, I got lost all my funding and everything and got sort of thrown out, even though many of the senior members of the organization did change their diets to what I was saying. And I could never understand why an insurance company, a medical insurance company, wouldn't want to make their people healthier. It didn't make sense to me because that's the whole focus of their business is to make people healthier. They actively promote that, but they don't use diet. And the only question I could suggest was that there's a conflict of interest somewhere, either with the pharmaceutical industry or with the food industry, the processed food industry, and that, that's, that, that they're in bed together and it, you can't break it down. It just doesn't, yeah, simply I, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I do think there's some very deep ties between insurance industries and pharmaceutical industries. You know, like they pay for the drugs and, the, you know, they, they get discounts. And I'm, I'm sure that model serves them both very well. Um, I would be remiss not to sort of because part of your life's work has been sports. And so, yeah. you know, we've all and, you know, you know that, you know, carbs are essential to perform athletically. You've got a carb load. You've got to do as a, the Scandinavians promoted in the late 60s. We've got to just eat all the pasta. And you made that reversal. Can you perform at a high level without a high-carb high diet? Is that possible? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you show it every day. But, but, apart, <laughs> but apart from that, uh, we, did, I, we did a lovely study with a group in Pennsylvania last year. And there's a, a tiny group at a, at a college, a state college. 
And they were meticulous. The research was meticulous. And they took a group of people, they reversed the diet. They went first for a period on a high carbohydrate, then reversed on a high fat diet, randomized, everything done properly. And they did 5K time trials on the treadmill. And we showed at the end of the day that there was absolutely no difference in performance. And these were these athletes were better than 88% of all American athletes. And they did not benefit one iota from a high carbohydrate diet. So our conclusion was that the average athlete in the United States and the rest of the world will not benefit from a high carbohydrate intake. Instead, they will likely not benefit because they will become more insulin resistant and develop type 2 diabetes. So as far as I'm concerned, when you talk to the average athlete and you tell them to eat carbohydrates, that is wrong. That's unethical to do that because the evidence doesn't support it. I will only agree that the Kenyans, who are the world's greatest runners at the marathon distance, up to the marathon distance, but not beyond, up to the marathon distance, they're the best, and they eat high-carbohydrate diets. So can, we cannot exclude at the moment that a high-carbohydrate diet does need to be eaten by world-class marathon runners and from distance, say, from five kilometers up to the marathon. But for the rest, no, I don't know. And I think once you go beyond the marathon, there's no biological reason why you need a high carbohydrate diet. All the biology tells you that you need a high fat diet. Yeah, I think one of the criticisms is that you know you're unable to sort of reconstitute glycogen adequately without significant carbohydrate. What does the research show on that? I mean, I've seen animal literature and human literature that's in contrast to that. Has that been your findings? Well, we have a publication looking at that, and we actually couldn't. We found that the glycogen levels were half. The, when they, than when they were eating high carbohydrate diets. But Stephen Finney's data, and I reviewed his paper, and I was very concerned about that because they found that the muscle glycogen was the same. And I did some calculations, and I'm convinced that there's an error. there was an error in that because they burned so much fuel during their exercise, you couldn't explain where it was all coming from. Where was the glycogen going to? Because they were burning so much fat, you couldn't understand where the glycogen was going to. So there seemed to be an error in that study. And I, I, I don't see any evidence that you can maintain muscle, high muscle glycogen content on a high fat diet, but I'm not sure you need it. You, you've still got half the stores that you need. Maybe that's enough. And the other question is whether you use ketones when you're doing high intensity exercise. And I think that's a question that's, that's going to be answered in the near future. You may well be burning quite a lot of ketones. And I must tell you that in fact, I have a paper and it's sitting right behind me there, which is in review and they've, they've, it's been sent back for, for new work from a group, a group of scientists looking at novel ways of measuring fat oxidation during high intensity exercise. And their techniques, but the techniques may be wrong, that's we have to admit, show that you burn quite a lot of fat at VO2 max. At 100% of maximum effort, you're burning quite a lot of fat. And no one has ever shown that before, but no one has, has tried to look at it. It's impossible to measure fat oxidation during high intensity exercise. And we've, we've been misled to think that you're burning only carbohydrate. That's what this research is showing. Yeah, I, I just wonder, you know, cause I, I've been doing this, you know, for, for years now. And I found that in what you talked about lactate and issue with rowing, I know I would row and it would be extremely, extremely painful. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you, you'd yeah. almost want to cry when you're done. I mean, very, and then when I switched over to a high fat approach and, and then eventually a carnivorous approach, I didn't get that, even though I was producing the same wattage and producing the same results, but I didn't have as much pain. So I think that allowed me. And I know you talk about the central governor theory. So that kind of in contrast to that a little bit. But uh, I wonder if there's a, you know, if there's a role for, you know, if we are using more, you know, fatty acids or ketones to fuel our, 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 our efforts, does it shut down or inhibit some of the lactate production? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that definitely. I mean, it has to be. The lactate production would be much less. So that, that's what I would predict. And so, but again, I haven't actually seen a proper study showing that, but I would predict that that's the case. We did some early studies years ago. We were one of the first groups to, after Steve Finney's looked at high fat diets, we did. And the irony was that our first two studies showed that the high fat diet improved performance. And this is in the 1980s when I was promoting the high carbohydrate diet. So I realized early on that there seemed to be some benefit from a high fat diet, but because of my connections with the high carbohydrate diet funders, we, we never really pushed it. And it's so much more difficult to study fat metabolism than carbohydrate metabolism. 
So it kind of got left behind. I must just before we go, I must tell you that that one of my great heroes is Dave Scott, the triathlete. And as he won six Ironmen on a high carbohydrate, almost vegetarian diet, where he read my book, The Real Meal Revolution, and he changed about five years ago. And he wrote to me to tell me, he said, if only I had your diet when I was running the Ironman, I would have been 40 minutes faster. <laughs> and he said, I will never tell any athlete that I'm training to eat a high carbohydrate diet. Now, this is a guy who spent since the 1970s in elite sport, and he comes to that conclusion. And he, it's a complete reversal of what he thought, and he's changed completely. And I like to go with the experts who are actually in the field and who's coaching and working with the athletes and who did it himself. I'm, that's the sort of opinion that, that I really appreciate. I wanted, before we go, Tim, I wanted to talk about a very, very super important topic, and that is predictions for the next World Cup with regards to rugby. South Africa going to repeat, or what's the deal? And what are those guys eating these days? No, <laughs> you know, they, they, it, it, <laughs> do you have any contact with the, with the folks at the South African Rugby Board? You know, I worked with the 2007 team that won the World Cup, and that was long before. We were pushing high carbs then, but, but we, we had a great coach. And then this year, the co Rossi Erasmus is just one of the great coaches. I mean, he stands up there with, with an all-time great rugby coach. He's an astonishing coach. You know, I, I'm actually just preparing a talk tomorrow morning for, on self-belief. And that's the one thing that American coaches teach, which we're not so good at, which I'm talking about football coaches. It's all about self-belief. And Rossi got that in, and he built this team of very, very different people, and some who come from absolute poverty. I mean, and they had unbelievable stories. It's an astonishing team that he built. So he, but he's a human being, a human, humanist, and he understood that part of the, of the, the, it's the culture. There was a picture of the team before without their shirts on, and everyone looked and said, oh my gosh, something's happened. They were all ripped like you. They were absolutely ripped. And I worked with the 2007 team, which also won the World Cup. None of them were ripped in those days. So something happened, and I don't think it's not steroids, because, but it was. I would suspect that the high carbohydrate, high fat diet is is much more used. Certainly, you know, in the New Zealanders are are moving towards a, a the hunting type high fat diet in their preparations. Yeah, there's even a few few of the top level of rugby players are, that have adopted, a, I think, a fully carnivorous diet. Sonny Bill Williams, a famous, you know, all-black yeah, loose right. forward. And uh, Owen Franks, one of the, one of their all-time great, you know, props and a few other ones over there. So it's, uh, we've got some, you know, NFL athletes in, in America that have adopted now that I've been in contact. And they said there's, there are quite a few of them doing it, you know, you know clandestinely, you know, because yeah. they... You know, but they're, they're using that, using using that as an approach. Um, well, Tim, this has been wonderful. Thank. You. I don't want to eat up any more of your time. This has been wonderful. Hopefully, we get you back on down the road when things, maybe when the next, you next, when you hit your next hurdle, and then we can talk about that. But thank you so much. It's always an honor to, be, to talk to you. Thank you for what you're doing for all of us and inspiring. And I hope. I hope I get to see you in person. At one of the, I know we, we got missed out on uh, Sweden uh, this year because of the pandemic. Hopefully, maybe this coming summer we'll get to meet, meet up. So, Thanks. And thanks for the privilege of being on your show. And good night, everyone. It's been a great privilege to speak to you. And I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye.